Okay, we are officially on the hour. Thank you for those of you who have joined us already. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from in the world. Thank you for joining us at Lucinity here for our webinar, How to Improve Productivity in AML. My name's Kate Wright, and I'm going to be hosting this. I'm Chief Customer Officer here at Lucinity. Um, we have invited you all today to this virtual event to talk about how we can improve productivity in the AML space. We previously talked about this several weeks ago, if you joined us for our first webinar on this topic, and we had a great amount of interest to move this forward. So we're being joined by a couple of people here today who can help us discuss this. Um, we are going to be talking about burnout and specifically how we combat alert fatigue in the AML space. Um, we want to look at how we can tangibly improve our employee well-being within AML teams um, and the subsequent impact that that can have on productivity. Um, as we enter 2023, we all know that this is going to be a really tough economic year. Um, with a possible global recession, it's going to be critical for the company to take care of its most important assets which we all know are their people, and how we can really make them more productive and able to excel in the roles that they have. We must ensure that we give them the tools to be able to do this, and we're gonna be having our two hosts talk about this today, how we keep these employees not only productive, but motivated in our role, and try to reduce churn and attrition within these critical teams. Um, the event today, we are joined by Leanne Spencer, a wellbeing speaker and burnout prevention expert, and our, co our founder here at Lucinity, GK, and our CEO. Um, together, they will be discussing how financial institutions can thrive amidst the very challenging year we have coming up. Um, I will pause there, and I'm going to allow our participants to introduce themselves. GK, I'd like to start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Gunderon Christiansson, and as you referred to me, I, I, I'm usually called GK for obvious reasons. I'm the founder of, and CEO of Lucinity. Um, my background is that before founding Lucinity, I was a director uh, of, of product, uh, man, uh, product at uh, or compliance surveillance technology at Citigroup. But before that, I was a, a director of product as, as, uh, of my system and I've uh, been in the compliance industry for a little over 15 years. And, and then before that, uh, I did a lot of data science and, and user experience driven, driven projects. Uh, being dyslexic myself, I'm always looking for uh, productivity, uh, enhancing tools and innovating approaches to actually enhance how I understand data and how I can communicate data. And that was kind of like uh, what was the, the inspiration for, for Lucinity, uh, giving uh, users tools that they can finally understand what is going on in the AML alerts and, and hopefully reduce uh, a little bit of the fatigue that they see every day. Over to you, Leah. Thank you very much, GK and Kate, and a big welcome to everyone who's just listening in as well. I'm Leanne Spencer. I'm a keynote speaker, author of three books. I've got about 10 years experience in the wellbeing sector and over 13 qualifications in exercise and nutrition. And prior to the, the last 10 years, I actually worked in the city for various different market data companies, including LexisNexis, where I worked on their AML KYC suite of products, uh, a LACRA as well, a OneSource. So quite an interesting blend of experience that I hope will very much pay dividend in this conversation. Fantastic. Thank you both. And we're going to move on to the chat in a minute, but just a few housekeeping points. We're going to have 15 minutes at the end of this. For anybody to raise questions that you have, there is a Q&A function in the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to add your questions there. You will also see a poll um, at the beginning of this session. You may have saw one and you will see them at the end. So please feel free to complete those polls. Um, during the session, we won't be taking questions, but please feel free to add them for the last 15 minutes of this session. Um, so to kick this off, Leanne, I'm going to come to you first here. Um, we've already talked about the difficult economic climate and how tough this year is going to be um, with the Russian invasion on Ukraine uh, still arguably coming out of COVID-19 and a possible global recession. Um, what do you think has been the impact on this of employees and their well-being? And a really tough question that I often hear is, is why should companies care to begin with? 
Yeah, great question to open up with. There are multifactorial challenges facing people at the moment. You've just outlined most of them. I don't need to go back through them. And that's drawing on people's financial well-being, their emotional well-being, their spiritual well-being, their physical well-being. It's being tested from a number of different areas and possibly more than one area as well. I think the reason why companies should care about this, you said it yourself, people are your prime assets. The health of your business is the health of your people. Or put another way, the health of your people is the health of your business. We need happy, healthy and resilient people to do good, meaningful, purposeful, value-based work. And I think it's very much a symbiotic relationship between the two. I think we as individuals have a responsibility towards our own well-being. You know, I need to make sure I've got myself into bed at a decent hour. I have some great tactics for nervous system management. I keep myself energized. But equally, I think for those who are in the working world, there is also an onus of responsibility on the employer to provide resources, all of the stuff I'm sure we'll get into, to provide a culture to role model desired behaviours. So it's very much what I would call a symbiotic relationship. And ultimately, you know, a happy individual is going to do better work. uh, They're going to deliver a better outcome to the customer. They're going to collaborate. They're going to be more creative. I think last couple of points, energy comes from one place in the body without getting too woo-woo about things. It comes from one place. If I have a lot of of my mental or emotional energy drawn because I'm worried about finances or I'm worried about my job security, that energy is coming from somewhere else. There's an opportunity cost to that energy. So the smart employer will think, I want that individual to present themselves in all areas of their life, but especially work, with as much energy as possible. If the if it's gone down for whatever reason, I'm getting less too. That's the simple transaction. Last point before I hand back to you is that people talk. What do you want them saying about your business? Mm-hmm. You know, and there's so much technology in our like glass store that enables people to immediately jump on and go, hmm, don't like this, or this company's amazing. So that's that's the you know, a number of reasons why I think it needs to be right up there, top of the priorities. Yeah, and that, that brings us really on really nicely to the next question that I have, actually. If you consider all of this stress that's happening in the world and everything that's happening outside of work, our last webinar talked a lot about alert fatigue that happens specifically in the AML space. Imagine bundling all of that stress together on top of the alert fatigue and having an overwhelming caseload when you come into work every day. Um, GK, this question's for you. What, what risk do financial institutions face when they don't address the issue of alert fatigue on top of everything else everyone's dealing with? So, so if we if we take a look, look at you know the what generally happens in recessions and what what happens especially uh, probably last year and into this year and everything like that, and we saw that in a lot of you know our clients uh, is that it actually increases the activity of money laundering and fraud and and all, 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 all other uh, other illegal activity in the world. That actually means uh, if you have a anti monitoring system that is rule based or that uh, simply just you know um, alerts on what it sees, uh, then uh, uh, without actually thinking thinking about it whether or not this makes sense or not, uh, there is a human being in the uh, in a, in a form of analyst that needs to react to 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 that, and therefore the workload of the analysts get uh, through through the roof. And you know, uh, when I I'm discussing with CEOs of fintechs and and other clients, uh, etc., everyone is talking about you know I need to hire more, I need to hire more, I need to hire more employees to uh, cope with actually the the influx of anti monitoring and fraud alerts are around uh, around the globe. And uh, and when when it comes to uh, thinking about uh, how to deal with that better, there are there is various ways to uh, to deal with that. You can you can implement better systems that you know, like I referred to in the beginning, you know, having a little bit of a creative way to to visualize uh, the way that uh, people see it, uh, a little bit of a creative way to give people contextual things about what is happening, monitor who is actually in the team uh, uh, likely to to actually not be handling all of the the, the increased uh, 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 pressures 
et cetera, et cetera. And, and th that is kind of what we do at Lucindy. We try to combine that into a software tool that gives the analyst the, the tools to uh, react to this influx and understand better, and, uh, et cetera. And to your question about alert empathy, alert factors comes from saying no, 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 all day long to a system that is 99 or 96 or 90 something percent uh, false. And you can imagine if you just say no all day, you will miss that uh, that that the single 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 thing. And if you don't have a friend uh, that is a coworker or maybe a software solution that that helps you uh, understand what is uh, good and what uh, what is not good and what you should look uh, cl closer at and so on, you you will start to feel uh, less productive. And what uh, what happens then? You will start to miss things, and you will start to either escalate far too much to to the next level, or what is more likely that you simply uh, miss the events that are uh, uh, more important, and that creates more and more more stress, and and that is a is kind of like a snowball effect bo both on the organization, employee, and everyone else. And that has a direct implication of the on the financial health of the, the fintech or the bank, uh, because you know if you look at uh, history, uh, then uh, these kind of events could have uh, been prevent prevented, of course, with better uh, detection, but also with better procedures around in the front line of, of the financial crime fighters that, that we work with. Thank you. And I know, I know GK's passion around the tools, so I really do want to come back to that in a moment. But I'm going to go to Leanne just really quickly to talk about the, the general best practices. What, what are the best practices that team leaders and managers can put in place to make sure they're effectively managing and supporting the, their resources and their employees' well-being? Mm. Well, I think, first of all, understand what's working, where are the gaps? Um, we can make assumptions, but things like pulse surveys can quickly surface what's working in terms of the resources we provide. Are they, you know, are they what people want? Um, so that's one point. Another key point, I think, is having leaders role model desired behaviours around well-being and um, alert fatigue prevention and staying energised. So, you know, for example, it could be a leader just talking about what they do before work to be energized or what they do throughout the day to stay energized and alert, you know, role modeling that behavior, not just monitoring the metrics that an individual submits, but actually demonstrating the sort of behaviors that keep, keep them feeling well. I think that's a really important point. Um, giving ownership to the, your teams about the overall well-being of teams. So having well-being champions, for example, so this isn't something pushed down, you know, we need you to do this because we want you more productive, but actually it's that symbiotic relationship that I talked about. I think providing resources, visual resources, so video, for example, audio resources, written resources, because everyone likes to consume content differently. GK said at the outset about dyslexia, so that may steer how you prefer to consume content. So providing something that's super inclusive, that if you like to watch, you can watch. If you want to read, you can read. Uh, what I think we've done really well in a lot of companies in the last coming up three years is provide resources for people, sleep content and all this sort of thing. What I'm hearing people ask for now is this is all great, but how do I practically implement this? So I think one sort of heads up for any team leaders on the call is what or, or what can you do to help people understand how to make improvements to sleep? How do I take breaks from my nervous system? Um, how do I stay alert and how do I take micro breaks or leverage micro breaks so that I'm I'm not missing things, not just clicking no, 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 no. Oh, you've just missed something, which you'll only find out retrospectively. Um, so the other thing is, is to make it personal. And you know, thinking about the compliance audience, alert fatigue is one of the big issues. Um, and I know we've we've got some content we're going to post about this later, but things like mini breaks, Pomodoro breaks, working for 25 minutes and taking a break and, and cycling through that, changing up the environment, um, giving the eyes an opportunity to rest by just taking your, if you wear glasses, take off your glasses if you don't. No need to buy any. Look out the window. Just just give your eyes a break. L little things like this can make such a profound difference. And coming back and tuning back in, daydreaming. Uh, what I call slivers of recovery, which you may remember if you were on the first webinar. All of these things are little tactics that are pretty inexpensive to teach and to encourage. 
um, that actually can help people reduce alert fatigue. Um, so a number of different things there, but essentially survey, find out what's working and where the gaps are, put your investment there. Role model desired behaviors from leaders. Give people resources in a very inclusive way. You know, they can consume that content in the way they want to. And I would say focus on giving people the how to less big picture, because that's where I think we're at right now. Fantastic. And I, I'd agree with all of that. And I would love to say I apply it. And I, I do sometimes and I don't sometimes. And I guess that's the challenge with having these huge workloads that we talk about. We we <laughs> talked about in the introduction the huge amount of cases and GK you mentioned the huge amount of alerts that people are just monotonously working through so how can we use technology to promote a more effective and efficient way of working to allow people to feel like they have the time to do these these things Leanne mentions that are so important to their well-being yeah so I think that um, uh, what Leanne summarized is is really a phenomenal way to to think about a, a human being because you know we are all uh, we need uh, to get energy for from somewhere we need sleep and you know one of the things that I didn't introduce about myself in in the beginning of the webinar is that I actually spent six and a half uh, years in sleep science so so uh, sleep technology so I know a little bit about it and how how important staying awake. Uh, is and how how difficult it is if you actually don't nurture yourself outside of work. You know when uh, when I founded the company, I, I founded it based on a on a theory called dogmatic intelligence, uh, which is 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 really not to focus only on technology, but to focus on the uh, the interaction between humans and actually the te technology and how humans can assist technology to do a better job and technology to. Uh, assist the human to to uh, be uh, to, uh, better, uh, to do a better job, and that is that is some uh, somehow you see that all over the industry right now. You're seeing this kind of technology that is a subsection of augmented intelligence coming out uh, through through the roof right now. You see ChatGPT, you see see other assistant uh, technology that that really accelerates how humans can do their job. And and then hopefully enjoy the the break too, so that they can uh, can think about uh, what they need to do when they return actually to the screen in interaction with the technology. But some of the, the so so one of the, the re, uh, some of the researches that that we have done in Lucindi and also prior to me uh, funding Lucindi saw that. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, correlation between, for example, alert fatigue and how much screen time you had prior to you taking an action on on on, on a case. So uh, we 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 have looked at uh, analysts working uh, uh, over an eight-hour day, and we saw a, a considerable uptick in actually uh, true positives or true cases after a coffee break. Uh, and and one of the things that technology can help you with is 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 to gamify a little bit how you how you do your uh, do your work and and right. and and organize the day differently uh, for you help you with that. It can then tell you stories. We as human beings, we love stories. And and one of the things that we we try to do at Lucinity is actually to turn boring data Excel tables into stories around uh, money laundering and and make them a little bit. You know, I wouldn't say fun, but engaging with it, with them because uh, when you tell uh, a data story through uh, a day, uh, tell about the data through the the art of sto storytelling and visualization, you get a, a a different kind of an engagement from your employees, and and that will leave uh, that has shown to see uh, have a better result when it comes to actually clicking the right yes, the right no, and and overall over the day it's just easier on the human uh, to, to work in a story mode, uh, in a visualization mode, than in an action table with uh, the other tools that, that, uh, that the technology can remind us on, on, on taking, taking a break or, 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 or distribute it uh, differently. So technology cannot do it alone. And humans can't do it alone, but together with, it can uh, reduce the load on, on both. Um, if I could just cut in there, I think that that's that's brilliant. I've got a blended solution of technology, 
with with what what we can do as a human being. And I think if we really started to understand or just remind ourselves what makes a human being and how, and obviously we're all different, but how we operate, that we need breaks, we need sleep, we need recovery, slivers, so small bits of recovery, as well as longer periods of recovery, like an empty weekend or a vacation. Uh, We need a light, we need movement. These aren't new things. But I think perhaps we need a reminder that we're talking about human beings processing alerts with massive consequences, not little machines or automatons. So they can they can work well with AI, but these are human beings. Let's remind ourselves what a human being needs and then look at the environment we're asking them to work in and, and, and doing a checklist. You know, do they have access to light? Are we giving them breaks? Are we encouraging breaks by taking them ourselves as leaders? Are we encouraging movement breaks? Do we have an office that's set up for physical movement for those who can, making sure we're being inclusive? Might be worth just going back to basics and thinking, you know, what does human being need to thrive in this environment and are we providing it? Fantastic. uh, Sorry, uh, GK, carry on. I think that's an excellent uh, uh, view because it's it's about the environment. And, you know, I'm a a software guy, so so I I start to think about the the software. This is about... You know how uh, we have for far too long anti monitoring has been just about finding 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 and then asking uh, people just to hey here is a lot of stuff to do and one of the things that human beings are actually very very bad at is to do a lot of things repeatedly repetitively we need breaks we need breaks we need we, we need breaks to actually operate at, at our fullest so so we need to design our our, our technology uh, with humans in mind just like we, 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 we design our environments, our employee, uh, uh, think about our employees, think about how we sleep. We need to design technologies so that actually it's designed for human, not against it. Yeah, and it, there's, there's obviously a joint responsibility here. We have the management of the teams are responsible to ensure that there are environmental factors in place that allow people to work to their best, but there's also the tools that we need to be providing them with. And DK, what you said about accelerating their ability to complete their work is fantastic. Leanne, I guess on the other side of that, there is an element of ownership that needs to be taken by the team members themselves. We we can, we can as managers, we can offer and we can empower that team, but how do they take ownership of their well-being? If you are in an AML team and you're, you're working through this day to day. Yeah, and I I think, as I said at the outset, I think it's a symbiotic relationship. I should be just as interested as you for perhaps different reasons in prioritising well-being. But I also feel that there can often be a a feeling of lack of control, a lack of autonomy um, by non-managerial, you know, perhaps people doing the some of the checks. um, In that you don't, you know, you aren't a leader, you aren't a manager necessarily, and you don't feel you have an awful lot of control over the volume of work that comes comes down. And I think it can be very empowering to, to think, well, what can I control? The adage, control the controllables. Uh, for me, autonomy is my North Star. Um, and quite often I'm hearing now that, that people don't feel like they have autonomy. Well, we do. We do have quite a lot of autonomy when it comes to our well-being. It's easier for some than others. You know, a childless 30-year-old may find sleep easier to come by than a new parent, for example. But we do have high levels of autonomy. So that, that's the thing. That what can you control? What could you can take ownership over? And I think linked with that, having a daily set of non-negotiables that keeps you well is a really good shout. So mine changed in the new year. I have three daily non-negotiables, which I'll share at high level. Uh, number one is sleep. Sleep for me used to have to start with a seven. So what I mean is seven hours in a minute, no problem. Seven hours and 59 minutes, great. It starts with a seven. For a number of reasons that we won't go into now, nothing sinister. It now now seems to be needing to start with an eight. So that's what I'm doing. Sleep starts with an eight, which may sound very luxurious. Don't hate me for it, but that's what I'm going for. The second one is daily breath work. Very, very powerful way of managing a nervous system. So prior to any sort of delivery or presentation, I'll be doing breath work. But I just do it as a preventative health measure at the beginning of the day as well. Just to set the right expectation on the day, bring the heart rate down a little bit bring the uh, the blood pressure down a little bit. So that's the second. And the third is a minimum number of steps because it keeps me alert and energized and gets good blood flow throughout the body and the brain. So I would suggest having at least one and not more than three daily non-negotiables. 
for you as an individual. And that goes for anybody at any level of an organization. Really good to have those daily non-negotiables keep you well. And be adaptable. I said that my uh, non-negotiables have changed from the back end of last year to this year. That's because circumstantially things have changed. Hormonally things have changed. So I'm, I'm willing to be adaptable. There'll be times that you'll just need more sleep and you'll be like, mm, well, you know, I don't normally need an extra hour of sleep. But right now you do. And it could be because of an increased emotional load or cr- increased physical load or increased mental load. I know there are busy periods of seasonality to, to AML. You know, I think Black Fridays, Chinese New Year, I believe, are, are some of those peak periods. Might just be you need to, to get more resources, more physical, men- uh, emotional, mental resources around that time. So be adaptable. Go with the flow. You know, if you need more, get more. Um, There's a lot of information out there, uh, how to sleep, how to move, what type of exercise is best, what type of diet you should be following. My advice would be to personalize that as much as you possibly can. Do what works for you and collate or distill down a few trusted sources. I might be one and I might not be, but a few trusted sources and follow them. Because otherwise, it's easy to become, a, I can feel overwhelmed and it's my game. So I can't imagine what it's like for someone who works at AML and has a number of other interests and just wants to try and do the right thing and prioritize health as best they can in their own context. So that's another point. And then finally, and we touched on this in the first webinar, just whether you're, you're working or you're leading or you're managing, don't expect high levels of performance all year round. You're setting us up self up or your team's up for for a fall. Uh, We need to have some some seasonality, if you call it that, or some cadence, which is my word, to how we approach things. You know, touching on that previous point that GK and I were talking about, about people being human beings with with a basic set of needs. Nobody can operate at, you know, sixth gear, if you like, all year round. Some of us will be able to do it for a couple of years before the creeks start to show. Some might do a few months and a few of us might just last a few weeks before we're like, I can't do this. No one can do it long term. So if you want a thriving business with very minimal um, uh, you know, alerts that get missed, then don't expect people to be right up against the wall all year round. We have to encourage and create a culture where they can take those breaks, they can prioritize their well-being. I think it's absolutely essential. Yeah, fantastic advice. And I think a lot of us saw through COVID and lockdown learned a lot about ourselves in trying to be everything all the time. Mm. So it certainly resonates with me. And we've we've talked a little bit now, Leanne, that's great advice about making the most of the humans. We we do have humans doing these roles and we can't forget that we're humans. And it's fantastic advice about how we get the best there. But GK, as you quite rightly said, we need to make sure that this is a combination of technology and humans working well together. So I'm going to come to you a little bit now to talk around the technology and how we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to to manage these workloads and really empower these teams. Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the things that uh, we at Lucinity, we think a lot about is what are humans good at and what are machines good at? And uh, what what we discovered was that, uh, that machines are really, really good at repetitive tasks. They're very good at connecting the dots on large data sets. They're really good at, at learning from actually the past. Uh, and and if, if the data is, is structured and, and today's uh, advancement in, in AI is, 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 is marvelous of, of uh, now the machine can learn from uh, a lot of unstructured uh, co- content and, and really do a good job in explaining. What, 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 uh, what machines are not yet good at is uh, uh, inductive th- thinking in, in actually connecting uh, the, the small dots and, and, and making, making uh, sure that this is actually what it needs to be doing. Even you know when you're you're uh, talking now to chat TDP when you're uh, when you're going back and for, uh, forward and that's the most advanced AI in the in the world you need to go back and forward you need to go back and forward to to get the uh, the technology to really do what it, it does and you can think about uh, the this uh, merging of technology and uh, uh, and humans as uh, coming very vividly through it when people are using ChatGPT, 
And that is how we have uh, approached it over the last uh, four, four years to, to create a user interface that uh, talks the human language, enables humans to uh, do less uh, by uh, uh, extracting the key data points that they need to take decisions on and are good at take, uh, 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 making decisions on. You know, is this normal? Is this uh, abnormal? Is this, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, you, you have here Leanne, she, she is doing a rapid movement of funds. You know, there is a lot of uh, activity on, on her account uh, b between GK and, and, and Leanne. Uh, you know, I think this is suspicious, but when a human being looks at it, it says, hmm, actually, Leon uh, is an uh, employee or or has this relationship. And that, that it, 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 it is this extra knowledge that uh, and this conversation between the human and, and the technology that that humans will not be replaced. Uh, and however, you know, when it comes to uh, this fatigue that we find right now of this overwhelming amount of data that our analysts in, in, the, uh, in the financial services um, uh, ML teams need to do, that needs to go down. Because if we are going to change the, uh, the game in anti laundering, you know, going from um, uh, finding roughly 0.1% of, of what is laundered through, through the world, maybe up to 5 5%, that, then we can't do the same as we did before. We need to figure out uh, technology that, fit, first of all, finds more. And that is actually the easy part. Uh, but the, 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 the difficult part is then how do you sort through everything that a machine thinks, hey, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool, and just starts to, to, to annoy uh, the human <laughs> all, all day long. Uh, and, and, and that is actually where, where, where technology uh, is at best. But then you need to apply a design thinking principles to the way that you design for the human. Uh, and et cetera. and and that is the environment that, that we want to create because with that you can uh, you can uh, get a true benefit of an uh, AML program. You you will have of course happier employees where where you have less uh, noise, less noise, uh, and and that is a direct correlation between you know you might uh, you could can deploy. Uh, those uh, people into higher value work uh, of actually finding financial crime and contributing uh, to the uh, more to the business of uh, of the financial uh, services. So so that the the end game for embracing technology and hu human uh, interactions is a safer world is a more ha happy world and is a a world where uh, a technology and a human can have a human-like conversation and they can help each other out uh, fighting financial crime. Fantastic, thank you. And we're going to move on to some questions that we've got posted soon, but I have one final question for both of you. Um, and it's around measurements and metrics. All of this will come down to being able to identify whether these are successful if we put these initiatives in place. Um, GK, I'll ask you on the technology side, and Leanne, I'll, I'll ask you to address the well-being side. If there is one key metric that you would advise people measure to ensure that these initiatives that they're putting in place are effective, what would that be? Uh, Leanne, I'll come to you first. Okay. Um, I think the obvious one is around number of alerts missed, uh, but that's probably more of GK's expertise. So I'll take it from the wellbeing perspective. Number of different ways you could measure uh, you know, how much talent you attract into the business, how well you retain it, what your engagement scores are, uh, pulse surveys. But here's the thing, I the, the, the big answer is something like an energy score. So the crudest example would be one to, to five, five, I'm on fire, you know, I, I could take on anything, one, the very opposite. There's some sort of score. And of course, you can make it a little bit more sophisticated than that. You could have three or four questions which feed into a score. Um, but tracking that energy score, and I've seen that done across some um, non-AML but fast-growing tech companies where they've implemented something like an energy score. And that's a really good way you can measure that quarterly to find out what is the energy going through the organization? How are people feeling? 
And it's natural that that would flux a little bit, by the way, because I don't know about you, but I'm not five out of five energy every single day. I make sure I'm five out of five when it matters. And then I'll drop back to three and then build on that energy. Or you do something, you've had a really great but intense week of work, it's going to drop. That's natural. Um, But energy score, I think, is a good way because that fundamentally is what we're measuring. Because if that's good, you know, you would hope that uh, there'd be fewer missed instances of, of, you know, and and you, you wouldn't get such an issue with alert fatigue as well. So... A little bit more meat needs to be put on the bones around the how, but something like an energy score, I think, would be a great metric. Fantastic. Thank you. And GK? So this is not an easy question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, because it has a few few uh, uh, few measures that I would do, and it's almost uh, kind of like a, uh, you need to measure a few few things in, in this process. So, so first of all, uh, you need to uh, review uh, completeness and, co- and quality of of your process, uh, and and there are various ways of do, uh, doing uh, that through quality assurance, uh, etc. Uh, the other uh, other thing that you need to to measure is a a, a measure of of, thru, uh, of throughput and how that changes with uh, new systems and new capabilities of 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 explaining things to uh, the, the, the analysts. Uh, because we all know that, uh, um, um, that it's not about you know, how many uh, alerts you go through. However, when you, are, uh, when you look at, uh, for example, level one, level two, le- level through, it's a throughput that goes through, through there. And the expectation is that you should have, uh, by implementing uh, better frontline uh, frontend uh, te- technologies, is that uh, that uh, there are more SARS uh, being delivered to to to, to reg- regulators because there is less true positive be- be- being lost. Uh, but also there are uh, the, the 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 speed of the review is get, uh, is getting better. The, uh, and then that is about uh, also looking at the burn down rate of uh, of it. So so this is coming from agile methodologies of of seeing how how quickly your team can burn down uh, the 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 case workload o- over time, because that's an indicator that if you if you see a constant level of of cases com- coming through. Uh, and your your burn down cycle are, are getting longer. That there is on, uh, could be something wrong with the technology. Could be something uh, wrong with the, the well being of the, of the employees. And then of course it is then uh, coupling it with uh, the employee satisfaction score, uh, which we have done with a few few of our clients, where we actually look at all of these scores with the employee sat- satisfaction score uh, to try to derive whether or not where things are breaking down, whether or not it's uh, is on the technology side or the hu- hu- human being side. So sorry, Kate, for not answering it with one measure. Uh, I, I, I kind of don't believe in one measure when it comes uh, to that. <laughs> it, was, it was a tough question, so I'll give you that. But I mean, I, I think to, to just end this off quickly, to, to think about my personal energy levels and the impact it has on feeling like my quality is good, feeling like I'm getting through that casework would have a definite impact. So you can see how it's so important to consider both of them. Um, I'll move on to some questions that we've had posted from the people who are attending. I will start with um, one from Hannah's. Um, It says, in previous roles, I've had employees who I suspected were a bit overloaded, but I had difficulty getting them to prioritize their mental health and manage their mental strain properly. Do you have any tips or advice for influencing them to do it other than being a role model? Um, I'll start with Leanne on this one, please. Yeah, tricky question, because the the bigger side is is sort of demonstrating the behaviours you'd like to see. Some people don't want to be led in that direction. There are people who don't want to put a great priority on, on their well-being for whatever reason. So I think we have to accept that we can't influence everyone positively, even though it might intellectually feel like an obvious thing to do. Why would you not want to have more energy, look after your mental health and so on? Um, but also being mindful of the fact that sometimes little little nudges, subtle nudges do have a positive effect. So it's looking at the long game, um, doing continuing to role model uh, and getting the benefits yourself, having resources available, 
Um, sometimes that individual will, will gently take on elements of what you're trying to promote or what they see working for colleagues without making any sort of overt statement about it. Um, it's accepting, I suppose, as part of, of the diversity that particularly now, but that we should seek within our workforce, that some people will have a different definition of well-being. Uh, and when I talk about happy, healthy and resilient or your fitness rate regime or something, I always uh, caveat it by saying as defined by you, because my idea of fit and healthy won't necessarily be the same as somebody else's. So I think keep doing the good work, keep um, being that positive role model, ensure those resources are there, incorporate subtle nudges as well. But just accept that people come to things in their own time and some people don't get there at all. And we have to accept that's part of the diversity that is having a group of people behind a common goal. Oh, you're muted, Kate. Well, it, it wouldn't be a video call if somebody wasn't. It sitting, wouldn't. Right. It yes. wouldn't be a webinar. OK, so I have another question here for Leanne again. Um, what are some common behavioral markers for possible mental overload and how can we spot them in our work and personal lives? That's a, okay. an interesting one. It is an interesting one. Yeah, we um, put together a resource, which is our, uh, you know, we can drop into the chat possibly called the 12 stages of burnout, but signs that people are starting to fatigue a little from a mental perspective would be that well, there's different presentations of this. Um, it can be internal and external. It can be active and passive. Things like missing deadlines, perhaps being more weary or cynical, uh, temper issues, temperament issues, um, things like their previously quite good self-care routine has changed or been neglected a little. Um, showing up for stuff, lack of creativity, not showing up for stuff, lack of creativity, um, all the way through to more serious mood disorders, you know, showing signs of anxiety, depression. Um, there were a lot of red flags uh, that you can identify. And if you know someone well, if you've got to know your teams well, you will spot that more easily than if you've been a little bit more distanced and hands off. But hopefully that's given you a few of those indicators to work with. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I have I have a question for GK that's around. We've talked a lot about human and machine needing to work together to get the most effective solution. What is your experience in the adoption of humans embracing machine, especially we, we have a lot of negativity when we talk about machine learning and AI and you talked about it not replacing people. How do we get people to really embrace that? I think by stop talking tech talk uh, and talking uh, uh, like human beings about technology. You know, no one wants to know the pure data science output in the, in the uh, uh, front end. That is for the da uh, data scientist to do. What you want is an engaging way of engaging with, uh, uh, with, with the system. You know, if you go to, um, if you don't, uh, if you, if you go to Instagram, you don't see um, the, uh, the the score th uh, that led Instagram to actually uh, show you a picture. You know, that would be a little bit of a boring Instagram when you're scrolling through and all you would say is, this is a third, uh, uh, we think it's a 56% uh, likelihood that you would like this picture. Do you want to see this picture? And, and that is kind of how we have designed our systems. We have designed it in anti-money laundering that, that we, we scroll through all of our alerts and it said, hey, uh, there is a 56% uh, chance that uh, I'm going to show you this, uh, that you want, like this uh, 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 alert. Here are the transactions. You figure it out whether or not you, uh, how, how, why I thought this was uh, important, how I thought it was uh, important, and actually what is the image that I want to, to, to show you. That's, let's turn it around. Let's actually uh, show the picture. And then if you want to ask the, uh, ask the, uh, the, the system, why did you show me this picture? Then you can ask it. It's simple design. Fantastic answer. Thank you very much. And that's it for the questions. So I would like to thank GK and Leanne for today. It's been a fantastic session and I've certainly gone away with, with an awful lot to think about. 
Um, we are going to continue to host things similar to this and different pieces of content through Lucinity. So please follow us on LinkedIn for any upcoming events or upcoming initiatives that we're going through. But I'd like to thank everybody for joining today and I look forward to seeing you again soon.